So I'm going to give you a, a little bit of a snapshot into our big idea and our pilot study that's due to start uh, the week of the 13th of November. Um, anybody that's on Twitter, that's my Twitter handle. The Health District are very good at tweeting, but not everybody within the Health District is. So wave the future, you have to do it. Okay. Well, yes, if it moved. Here we are. Okay. So I'm going to first talk about uh, a little bit of background and then I'll tell you about the project. So you actually, the most risky time of your life is actually in utero and on the first day of life. Your you most uh, rapid development, it's also the, potentially the most likely to alter your later life risk of chronic disease. So you're actually more likely to die on the first day of life than at any other time in life until you hit 85, which is why healthy futures need to start early and potentially even earlier than in the first early years of childhood. So life in the womb might be written on your tomb. Okay, so that was just a picture of Time magazine there, just to say that um, in 2010, this was the, the front cover of Time magazine, and it was all about the new science of early origins, which at that time wasn't very new, but the world caught on. So there has been postulated theories about early life origins of multiple non-communicable diseases, but one of the most important and one of the most prevalent from a public health perspective is obesity. And we've just heard all the great work that Healthy Beginnings are doing. And we have transitioned now from a world in which there were more people that were hungry to a world in which there are now more people who are overweight and obese. And that has been well publicised across the world in series like The Lancet. And we are no different in Sydney Local Health District. There's a gap between um, both women and men with overweight and obesity. And currently, the largest rise in obesity in populations is women of reproductive age. So currently, just go back here, one in two women enter a pregnancy with a BMI more than 25. That's one in two of us in this room. That's certainly me, was certainly me in my pregnancies. This is the new normal, but it's really important for future generations because there are risks associated with getting pregnant and staying pregnant, with complications during pregnancy, and with having a child who survives and a child who goes on to also develop obesity, as well as complications around the time of birth. And as we already heard from Greer, if you are larger as an infant, you're much more likely to be larger as a child and therefore as an adult. And if this keeps going throughout life, um, you actually have a higher risk of um, a cardiovascular death if your mother was overweight or obese in pregnancy. So this is longitudinal data from Scotland showing that as you go all the way through life, this risk is still there. So we need to start early. We absolutely need healthy futures. And this diagram is from the Life Course Centre in Southampton. And it just shows that traditionally with health, we intervene late. Once people present with a problem, they present with a disease or a complication of a health issue. But in order to change that trajectory, we need to start earlier and we might have less money spent at the other end of life with those health problems. So I'll tell you a bit about the journey of this study and where we are now. So it has been a long and winding road um, to this study. And um, I work both at Royal Prince Alfred and the Charles Perkins Centre. And in the vision of the Charles Perkins Centre and in collaboration with the district, there was this initial um, concept of a longitudinal cohort that could pool people from different disciplines, that could partner with different parts of the university in different parts of the city. And they did some work around that, holding research question workshops, multiple meetings, many researchers. And we tried to pull all of that together um, in 2015 and 16 so that we actually got clinicians and the community involved in this very academic process. And now we have some light at the end of the tunnel. So the overall aim <laughs> of this project is to look at modifiable risks and interventions before pregnancy and during pregnancy that have an impact on later life health. Okay, so we used a process 
um, which uh, is called a Priority Setting Partnership, which has been set up by an NGO in the UK called the James Lind Alliance. So James Lind, as I'm sure most people know, was the first person to run an RCT, and he discovered scurvy. So he, he uh, was the very first RCT of um, ships which had oranges and citrus fruits and ships that did not. And if you did not, you were much more likely to die. First RCT, very important. So James Lind Alliance is a way to involve clinicians and community and consumers into creating questions and forming questions that are most important to them. Because often in research, those questions come from the scientists or they come from the lab or they come from the place that's already got the money and uh, has, is ready to um, being able to spend it. So we took some of the questions that had already been created and we wanted to um, increase the um, interventional questions in there. A lot of questions in universities are about discovery and that is very important, but it's also so important to have questions around what actually works. Because as clinicians, that's what I'm interested in, what actually works? What am I going to do with the next person that comes in pregnant? And we held a priority setting workshop and a, a Delphi survey process to try and rank those questions and um, which included lit review to see which questions were truly unanswered. So we've come out of this with about 30 top ranked priority questions and there's now a balance between interventions and discovery questions. So these are some of the questions. You can see whether there, it's an I for intervention or D for discovery and the grading. So there's some things here about preconception, pregnancy, mental health, microbiome, um, epigenetics, um, glucose tolerance, that sort of thing. So the study that we've designed covers a lot of different areas which are all based on these questions, which are not made up by me, they've made up through this structured process. Um, we're looking at lots of different um, scientific um, testing, but also validated questionnaires, and linking all of that through um, clinical outcomes. We're interested before pregnancy, during pregnancy, and after pregnancy. And once the same-sex marriage vote is passed, I'll change all of this and it will all not be like this. <laughs> um, so, the, um, the, the, the big idea, and what we need much more funding to do than our pilot, is that we will have a three-tiered study that will involve multiple sites, as well as Sydney Local Health District, People who are planning pregnancy or in very early pregnancy, if they're eligible, will be asked to join a trial uh, that's looking at some of the interventional questions. And if they don't want to in, uh, be in an interventional study, they'll be asked to contribute their data and some samples as part of a much larger cohort. And everybody in those two tiers will be asked to consent for prospective data linkage of their children to future health and education outcomes. So we are very privileged in New South Wales to have great ability to link data to your outcomes through life, your preschool testing, your NAPLAN scores, your emergency admissions, your PBS and MBS data. And the cherry on the top is the pilot, and that's because that's what we have the funding for to start, and we're starting shortly. So the big picture would be these, these sites, and the pilot is uh, just at RPA at the moment. So our pilot study will recruit 500 um, women and their partner. We want to look at the feasibility of doing this embedded into healthcare of the prospective cohort aspect and the sample collection um, embedded into that um, pathway. We're going from preconception or the first trimester of pregnancy up to six months postpartum in the first instance. And these are the time points as you go along. And you can see, in order to set up these, um, this study, we've actually created a joint clinic within the Charles Perkins Centre for public patients who are having their antenatal care at RPA. So on an annual basis, at least 1,500 um, of the five and just over 5,000 patients will actually have their antenatal um, ultrasounds and booking through the Charles Perkins Centre and they will know that that's a research focused clinic and they will also be consented obviously for the study but this infrastructure enables us to do this um, without um, big funding. So you can see there's about eight visits there, we're looking at uh, measurements, at questions and at some of those biological samples. 
We have a, a donation, a philanthropic donation that's going to allow us to support biobanking in the pilot. And so our launch is timed with the opening of the New South Wales Biobank in the same week. As I said, it's embedded into clinical care. So we are very much in partnership with RPA Women and Babies and the district and the CPC RPA clinic um, in order to try and have that comprehensive clinical research service for women and babies. So it's novel because we're starting even before the beginning, we're having healthy beginnings, pre-healthy beginnings. Um, we've had the structure to create our questions. We're going to run interventional studies beside the cohort and we're um, having uh, longitudinal data from those biological samples. So there are multiple birth cohorts. Most of them start late and most of them don't have any longitudinal data so that you can work out change over time. Perspective linkage, it's a great opportunity for multidisciplinary collaboration and there are multiple people involved but this is who's involved primarily with the pilot and thank you very much.